Welcome, everyone. I'm excited to have you join us today for our conversation. Uh, please um, note that uh, there are bios for our guests, so I won't go through big introductions, but I'm excited to be here with Dr. Pamela Cantor, Dr. Sanjay Sharma, and Lukman Ramsey to talk about the future of the classroom. Um, the reality is that we know is that our education has not changed dramatically over the last 100 years. And in fact, the core foundation of what you see in classrooms has been in practice for about a thousand years. Um, there's almost no other field that you could think of where the fundamentals underpinning how people do the work has not changed significantly during that period of time. And yet we know that even though we don't see that reflected in our classrooms and in our other learning environments, the reality is that there's been advances in learning science, there's been advances in technology, there's been advances in almost every aspect of science that we understand about our biology and our behavior, and somehow that is not translated into the way we um, change our practice. So one of the things that we want to do today is explore with our guests from their various perspectives about what the opportunity is and what we have missed in the uh, by not actually bringing what we know today and doing the work to figure out how you, we can actually build a better future inside the kinds of learning environments and relationships and experiences that our young people need to thrive. Um, the uh, we're going to be going pretty quickly through this, so I want you to pay close attention because it's actually the integrated view of these guests that gives you a really clear picture of where things are going to head in the future. Um, and how we can actually scale the kinds of environments that allow us to address the significant inequities that have existed in our systems, um, frankly, since their beginning. Um, with that, I want to turn it to our first guest, Dr. Pamela Cantor, um, because one of the first things that we know is that we now know more about the brain than we have ever known before. Um, we know more about uh, uh, the way that the brain touches on almost everything. And with that, Pam, why don't you tell us how um, what we now know about the brain uh, allows us to think about differently about how we develop the complex skills that are required in our future world. So Jim, as you know, child psychiatry is my background in medicine. And one of the things that I've been doing over the last years is in fact trying to make the knowledge that we have today part of what we can use to change schooling, learning, and all of the learning settings that our kids are in. If it was before COVID and many of the recent events that have impacted our nation, and I had the opportunity to talk to you about human development, the development of the brain, and learning science, I would have started with this. There are about 20,000 genes in the human genome, yet in our lifetime, fewer than 10% will ever be expressed. Okay, what determines what's in that 10%? It is context the environment's experiences and relationships in our lives. It's context that determines who we become, how we learn, and even the expression of our genes. The risks, but also the opportunities in development and learning sit inside this one point, that there's no separation between nature and nurture, biology and environment, or brain and behavior, only a collaboration. So developmental and learning science does tell a very optimistic story about what's possible because children's brains and bodies are malleable to experience because the human brain is a dynamic living structure made up of tissue that is the most susceptible to change from experience of any tissue in the human body. The brain is malleable over time. Most of its growth happens after we're born. So there are multiple opportunities to catch up along the way. If there were three things I wanted you to remember about brain development, it's the astounding malleability of the human brain, experience-dependent growth, and the role of context. But to understand context and how it gets under the skin and into our brains, you need to know about the limbic system. The limbic system is the learning center of the brain. It has three structures, the prefrontal cortex for focus and attention, the hippocampus for working memory, and the amygdala, which regulates emotion. And to give you an example of how context gets inside, we have two hormones, one that responds to stress, cortisol, one that responds to love, oxytocin. It's not an accident. These hormones carry chemical messages about our experiences to the brain to the very same target, the limbic system. So when we say context drives development, that's what we mean. And this is why one of the most powerful examples of positive context is the human relationship. 
Relationships are biologically mediated by the powerful hormone oxytocin. This is the hormone that produces feelings of love, trust, attachment, safety. It's an activator of learning centers that power motivation and agency. Oxytocin is also the reason that trauma is reversible. Not the events, but the feelings and emotions are reversible. So when we speak about the human relationship, we're speaking about a, con a connection that is built through consistent caring, protection, presence, and trust. The kind that can make a child believe something about themselves they couldn't believe until you entered their life. Like, awesome. I am smart. I can do this. It makes me literally crazy when people talk about relationships as the soft stuff because our brains are electrical structures. And like all electrical structures, awesome. they need a power source. The power source is human experience and relationship. The neurochemicals and hormones like oxytocin power the motivation systems of the brain, the systems that encourage exploration, curiosity, and practice. That's fantastic. I want to make sure that because there was a lot packed in there. I forgot to tell the, our guests to make sure that they had their pencils and papers out um, and, ready to, <laughs> and ready to take notes. Um, it, it, there's an incredible amount of insight into how the brain works and especially how important these other factors like relationships are that sometimes we underestimate. Um, I wanted to just make sure I gave a chance for Sanjay to get into the conversation because his really interesting book, Grasp, um, it looks as our schools are not built for the brains that Pam was describing. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you meant by that, Sanjay? Yeah, building no, on um, building on incredible intro by Pam. Yeah, no, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Sanjay Sarma, professor at MIT, after recently a vice president for Open Learning at MIT. Um, when we think about learning, um, think about, for example, a zebra. A baby zebra can run within an hour of birth. Human beings are very different, as Pam explained. Human beings make a, we've made a contract with evolution, which is we are, we, we are learning animals and teaching animals. Parenting is teaching and, you know, being a child is learning. But we are vulnerable much longer, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And then we are ready to take on the world. So the model for learning, which, by the way, persists through adulthood, is actually think of yourself as a child, or think of yourself as a parent with your child in the back seat. And all the instincts that we bring to bear, which are by definition instinctive, actually apply to learning. So you know, for example, love plays a huge role. And yet in a lot of classrooms, it is a fear and um, it's a little bit of a threat and it's a little bit of, uh, you know, the um, tension of the exam and performance. So that's not as oxytocin. Here's another one. Curiosity uh, plays a huge role. And there's a lot of research that shows that you make someone curious, um, they um, generate a dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. And dopamine um, is also associated with novelty, by the way. And once dopamine is generated, the human brain, brain is in, in uh, adoption mode. Um, so we know all this. And as a parent, you know when your child is sitting in the back seat. When, you know, you can almost feel it in the back of your head, can't you, when they roll their eyes, you know? And, um, you know, my, my daughter used to say to me, Daddy, don't lecture. Don't lecture me. And I used to say, Honey, that's what I do for a living, you know? You know to back off. So we, the other thing is we know about the small chunks in education, in learning. We know that when you learn something small, you want to apply it. You know about letting go and letting something called the Ebbinghaus uh, forgetting curve kick in. The basic idea there is when you start forgetting something, it's okay. And it's only when you're about to forget it, if you get reminded, that you learn much better. By the way, this has been replicated in fruit flies and in a worm called C. elegans, which I know is not a target market for schools, but that's how fundamental it is. So we know all these tricks, and by definition, the classroom is designed uh, not only to not deliver this, but actually to subvert everything that uh, Pam talked about and everything I'm describing. Um, because the fact is the classroom was designed, as you said, Jim, and you kicked it off, you know, a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, 100 years ago, to sort of sit people down and assume that the teacher has the pen and the student's brain is a sheet of paper. And all the teacher has to do is write and declare victory. And if the student forgets, it's their fault. I'll end with this. The model we should take is one of teaching, is treating the student 
like a plant growing. They're formulating a model of the world. You don't give the plant sunlight or water when, you, when it's convenient for you, right? You can't give it all the water the plant needs for its life on day one and declare victory. You have to feed it. You have to care for it. And the student is formulating a model of the world. It's a little bit you have to be adaptive. The flipped classroom, all these things are recognitions of this reality, which are late in coming and yet stodgily held off. So I think, yes, the classroom is not designed for it because, in fact, your car, right, with your child sitting behind you is. Fantastic. And, I, you know, it's interesting. I think I misspoke at the beginning because I think we're actually focused on not only the fact that the classrooms need to be redesigned, but actually whole schools and whole education systems need to be redesigned. Um, as I come to you, Lukeman, you know, uh, you, uh, what's great about, um, I've learned about you is that even though you work deeply in technology, you don't think it's a, te a panacea for the biggest problems in the learning space. And you recognize the role of the teacher or in the classroom and actually providing the kinds of uh, growth experiences that our young people actually need. So you're sitting in a pretty pivotal role at Google, and you are thinking about the ways in which technology can influence the, the frankly, the next generation of learning. Um, how do you think about the, the lessons that we've heard now from Pam and Sanjay and what we now know about how people learn and the way that technology can actually facilitate creating new kinds of schools and classrooms that actually take advantage of this insight? Yeah, thanks, Jim. So uh, just briefly by introduction, I started my journey in this area at MIT studying cognitive science and computer science. Um, and, and then uh, my first uh, job out of MIT was uh, as a high school teacher uh, through Teacher America. Um, and many years later, after some startups in education technology landed at Google, um, at a time at Google where there wasn't really uh, education technology practice uh, here. Uh, so I was fortunate to, um, you know, uh, help to build that. Uh, and uh, th that was six years ago. So at this point now, we are actively working on a foundational platform uh, to power what we think of as the next generation of education, you know, uh, for schools that uh, we hope will reflect a lot of the things that, you know, Pam and, and Sanjay talked about. Um, because, uh, you know, let's, let's the, the situation is, is probably even more dire than people really appreciate. Like, you know, just start with skills and knowledge. It's not that uncontroversial to say that skills and knowledge are at the heart of education, um, or at least they're, import, they're an important part of it. That's what schools are trying to do is transmit skills and knowledge. And yet, in the educational process, there is really no ability for schools, for teachers, for you know, people that uh, administer curriculum to understand how well skill, any particular skill or any item of knowledge is being taught, how effectively it is being taught. And in fact, they, it's, it's um, mostly the case that they don't have a representation of all the skills and, and knowledge that they are trying to teach, um, you know, somewhere. Uh, and, and again, in, in technology, we can store this, you know, in, in, in data. Uh, but the problem is, is deeper than that. And, and um, that's um, because the, the things that Sanjay and, and Pam talked about are even farther away from teachers. The, the dark matter of education, uh, the fact that teachers don't have any insight into affect or how their students feel about what they're learning. Uh, things like, um, and we know things like anxiety and confidence and enthusiasm uh, probably make more of a difference in education than any um, you know, pedagogical techniques or you know, uh, uh, anything else that we're doing. You can teach all the uh, uh, kids all the, all the facts about algebra, but when they sit down for that test and they have anxiety and they can't remember anything, uh, then they fail the test. Um, and that happens uh, times a million across all the schools uh, in this country and, and really around the globe. So we have to build technology that not just that doesn't just enable the effective representation and transmission of skills and knowledge, but also pays attention to the entire child or the entire learner. Hey, hey Luke, can uh, I question? We're so far from that <laughs> that there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, can I can I just because I want to unpack what you're saying just a little bit because you know if I if I'm a teacher and I have a scope and sequence for my class and I have a textbook you know isn't that like a representation of knowledge and skills and 
you know, I, I, I can look at my kids and I can tell how they're doing um, when I'm in the classroom. So when you say that they don't have representations of things, say a little bit more about what you mean by that. Yeah. So what you would like to have uh, is a dashboard where a teacher could pull up uh, on a screen and look across all of the skills and all of the knowledge. And by the way, I, I, I keep making this distinction between those two for a reason. Um, they're, okay. they're, they're separate things. Um, they obviously very important, both of them, uh, you know, and skills are the, the currency and parlance of modern education. So it's not revolutionary to think about uh, what we want to do is teaching skills, but skills are kind of useless without knowledge. Um, they, they, yeah. they rely on knowledge and, and knowledge is really kind of useless without skills. So you can learn, you know, everything inside a textbook. Uh, but if you don't actually have the skill to put, put it into practice, then you're not really able to do anything useful. Um, and as I said, the, um, what you do not have in education today anywhere at any school is um, the ability for an instructor or uh, uh, someone who manages curriculum to pull up a dashboard and, and first see all the skills and all the knowledge that, you know, in this course or degree program or whatever they're trying to teach uh, are part of that program. And, and secondly, how well learners are performing, how well, you know, how well textbooks are performing or any of the learning content or learning tools or, you know, uh, any of the artifacts of education. So, so yes, you are right that knowledge lives in textbooks. Uh, where do skills live? Actually, that's kind of an interesting question by itself. Um, you know, uh, they, they generally come from the requirements of the workforce, uh, of yeah. what employers need, uh, or, uh, or standards bodies like Common Core, right, who, who, you know, create taxonomies of skills. Um, so they exist, um, and, and teachers have access to them. Teachers know in a, you know, given course in middle school what skills they are supposed to transmit to their students. It's, but that, that list lives in a document somewhere that they don't use in their day-to-day -day teaching life. And they do not, again, have the ability to measure any of it, any of it. So you cannot improve, uh, obviously, what you cannot measure. Or you cannot even know how well you're doing. You know, the measurement systems that we have today for education are, are the ones that we know about, summative tests and grades, right? That, that's how, how education is being measured. And it's just, you know, measuring a tiny slice of, of what really matters to the, to the entire learner. So this is this is super helpful. I mean, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I, I did a bunch of work around advanced research and development. And as part of that, kind of laid out, well, what are the fundamental questions that we need to be able to answer? And you all kind of just really hit them, right? Which is, what do we know about how people actually learn? Like, what is the underlying science to that? And frankly, multiple sciences that need to be integrated to point to create a much more holistic view of human development. Um, how do we get better at identifying and describing what it is that people need to be able to know and do and all of these different things that we actually um uh, want them to know and be able to do, and whether it's in the academic context or any other context, um, what are the um, experiences and relationships and environments that actually lead to the production of the, the, the of progress and mastery of those things? Um, and how do we even measure progress and measure mastery of those things, especially the things that are hard? And it was really fascinating that, you know, when you got to that first question, both Sanjay and Pam, focused on the biological underpinnings uh, that we recognize about how people learn and how they get activated. And it's not only activated through the, the practice and skill development, but more importantly, as Pam described, through things like the relationships. And as everyone has referred to, the context that people find themselves in, is it safe or is it threatening? And all of those things are have interdependencies that determine whether or not someone's gonna have a great learning experience. Um, so Pam, um, one of the things that is a distinction in all that is this distinction between uh, acquiring knowledge, if you will, and performing in, in a whole variety of different ways. Can you talk a little bit about what is it that actually drives performance in these different contexts um, and how it actually ought to shape the way we think about school and school systems and learning in general? So. The idea that I'd start to answer that question by citing a study from 1984, Benjamin Bloom's Two Sigma study, where he demonstrated that if you could build highly favorable conditions into all the environments in which children grow and learn, that it would put many children on the path to realizing their fullest potential and to equity of learning and experience. His proxy 
for highly favorable conditions was an individual tutor. And he found that if a, if a child had an individual tutor, he could take a student performing at the 50th percentile, move them up two standard deviations through the experience of individual tutoring. But when he studied his data, he realized that the active ingredient that generated the outcomes that he got was not the content alone. It was the content plus the connection, the nature of the relationship to the tutor. So you think for a moment about your own lives, and for most of us, there was a person who saw what we could be before we did. But relationships can't do it all. Now what we have to do is reproduce the experience Bloom described at scale. We have to do something that's not just better, something really different. So there, one of my heroes is Zaretta Hammond, an author, educator, and she talks about how one of the most important jobs that we have to get right is what she calls building cognitive muscles, muscles that help kids carry more cognitive load. So they tackle more and more rigorous material. Coaches know this, coaches who want high performance from their athletes. They know that top performance in an elite athlete is derived from pattern recognition and that pattern recognition is derived from deliberate practice. So what's actually going on here is that the wiring of our brains has now taken on these new skills but embedded them. So they're automatic, they're fluent. We've all had this experience and it's less effortful. And because of that, we take on more. More can be asked of our minds and our bodies. This is where higher and higher levels of performance and expertise come from. Chunking of information, pattern recognition, automation, performance, and then expertise. Skills at this level can appear to be innate, but they're not. They can be referred to as talent, which it isn't. What we're watching is performance at the top of a person's developmental range. And we know that for most of us, and certainly most of our students, they never get to explore the upper end of their developmental range in classrooms and schools designed the way they still are today. Among psychologists and coaches, they, they put this out in a single phrase. It's about the software, not the hardware. So imagine what it would mean if we could create experiences to make this type of performance possible for any young person that's how we get to accelerating the expression of their individual potential. Thanks. I appreciate that, Pam. As you know, that's one of my favorite studies. And, you know, for me, there's a lot of people, including me, who have emphasized the importance of the one-to-one the -one connection there and the tutoring aspect of it. But for me, the most important part of it is the recognition that, you know, at, at two sigma, that means the bottom performing students, the folks in the bottom decile are in the 80th plus percentile at that stage. And so the real lesson from this is that all of the kids are capable of most of the things that we actually ask them to do, and we're not figuring out how to actually help them to do that. Um, uh, Sanjay, in your book, you actually talked about how we actually have built a system for selection and sorting and narrowing of, of the knowledge base instead of expanding and contextualizing it, um, and what actually that means. Could you tell me about what more about that, and in particular, the um, work that you've done with uh, um, at MIT and the course that you developed? You're on, You're mute. on mute, sir. All good. Thank All you. good. Yeah. How long before we say this to someone when you were in person? You know, you're on mute. <laughs> 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 or mute, mute yourself. No. Um, the um, I think that um, I just want to pick up on Pam's excellent um, um, the quote she used about it's about the software, not the hardware. Um, one of the challenges with our education system, and not just in, in America, but in India, where I grew up, where we have the caste system, is that it's easy to just point to the hardware, and then it also leads to all sorts of horrible things like racism, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is we're all the same. It's the hardware, and it's the software that we can work on. And the problem with that is we also have a conflict of interest. Teachers want to work on the software and they want to grade the software, right? That's a bit of a conflict because if I didn't teach very yes, well. I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure that, because I know sometimes I can feel a little bit slow. What do you mean by the hardware and the software? Excellent. The hardware is a computer. The software is the Microsoft Word or the operating yeah, yeah, system yeah. you have on it, right? What's so that got to do with humans and learning? Yeah. So Gene let's take a step back. <laughs> 
the hardware is the brain. Our brains mm. are identical. We're all flesh and blood. Every baby is a potential Einstein. The software is the education the child receives that turns right. them into Einstein or not. But And by the way, every child who learns to speak does something miraculous. So they've already proven themselves. So it's not, there's no other question. It's up to us as teachers to turn them into an Einstein or, you know, whatever, right? Into, right. you know, some great author, right? The challenge for us is there's a conflict of interest. The teacher's teaching and the teacher's also grading. To some extent, that's a bit of a conflict. But more importantly, I think what's happened to the education system is we have become, uh, we have, I think, to some extent, forsaken our sacred duty to transform the individual and become more and more graders, winners. This student is not that great. That student is fantastic. And in doing so, we're reinforcing that argument that it's the hardware, not the software. Because, of course, my software, the first software I'm putting there, it's fantastic, which is not true, right? And I don't blame the teacher per se. It's the system. It's the everything. So the winnowing aspect, the winners and the losers, the sorting hat from Harry Potter, right? That has become a, a preeminent thing in our education system. That's got to change. Coming back to Benjamin Bloom, I think what we need to do is say that I'm, and by the way, again, using, using the parental analogy, I will transform this beautiful brain to everything this young person, even this old person, this middle-aged person can be. <laughs> Right. I just went to a yoga class and I thought the teachers took that approach. Right. Which is I will transform you as opposed to, eh, you know, it's a software. If you don't do well, I'll just give you a grade in in 2007, which is a course that um, longstanding at MIT licensed to design. Lukeman will remember it. Uh, students get kits they design robots and they compete on a stage. By the way, all these robot war courses owe their existence to Woody Flores, uh, uh, an amazing professor at MIT who developed this course, and I taught it as well for a few years, and that's featured in the book. What we do there is give students kits, and it's all about coaching. It's about make the best machine you can, and they don't get graded on the machine. They get graded on their journey, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the student who wins the, makes the machine that wins doesn't get an A, and everyone else gets Bs and Cs. It's about the coaching and how diligent were the students, and they take the lessons. And often, you know, the winning depends on you know, your strategy, matchups, etc. So this approach that I hereby um, uh, promise you that I will transform you to the greatest you can be has to be, I think, in our future as educators, not one of, eh, I'll do what I can and just give you a grade. Yeah. So, I mean, um, Lupin, Pam and Sanjay have talked about how uh, the reality is that, you know, humans are created with the opportunity to have all the things that we want them to know and be able to do at their disposal. And we are failing short of actually delivering on that promise that um, that if we actually take the frame that Sanjay said of saying, hey, I'm going to help you realize your full potential, that that's more than enough for almost anything that we're ever going to ask. And yet our systems are not designed for that. And sometimes the, 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 the very tools and resources that we actually equip teachers and school environments with get in the way. So are there things in particular that um, are features of the new design that technology can enable or tools or resources that can be made available that are going to allow us to unleash the potential of humans more freely um, and to let not just the exceptional uh, top 1% of all teachers take this kind of orientation and actually achieve this outcome. But all teachers will have the opportunity to do that in the classroom with their with their kids. And frankly, because that's what they are in there to do. Um, well, we, we hope so. Uh, we think we, um, you know, we understand the problem better than uh, before. We know that, you know, it, you have to start with understanding where the learner is at when they start their journey. Um, and that is a measurement problem, you know, in some sense, like you have to have a, an, a, a holistic picture of that person. Um, and then you have to understand what their goal is. You know, it could be just finish third grade um, or it could be, you know, more likely I need to acquire some skills and knowledge in order to enable me to be, you know, a useful member of society or to, to, to get a particular job. <laughs> Um, and, and as long as you know what skills and knowledge are associated with that goal, uh, then you can design 
a personalized path of learning that allows that learner from where they they stay, sit today to sure. get to where they're trying to go. Um, and if you could do that in such a way that as they traverse that path, um, that the, the path could change because life circumstances change or we learn, we learn more about the learner. Maybe we didn't really understand all that we thought we did about their, you know, how they feel about, you know, math um, or, uh, or something happens in their life, uh, you know, life circumstances change, with the, which they tend to do in, in real lives. And, and, and we're able to adjust that path. Um, that is the, that's the vision. Um, and that really, that vision really applies to all levels of education. It should be the case that, um, you know, uh, kids and adult learners have the same opportunity to have a personalized path of learning. That's not the same, I would argue, as adaptive learning, just to kind of throw out a, a, a buzzword that has been popular in sure. the space for a long time. Um, it, it's, it's really putting the student first in agency, in a position of agency so that um, mm -hmm. they understand their path and it's explained to them. And if, you know, and they're informed uh, by, by what their goals are and what skills and knowledge are associated with that and, um, you know, able to provide feedback into that process. Um, and uh, that, you know, you have sufficient infrastructure from, you know, all of the things and people that, that are needed to provide that, that path. Uh, can, you, to, can you stay on that one for a second? Because sure. um, one of the things that has come through this conversation is that there is this part that I'll, I'll call is this mapping, right, of really understanding what people know today and where the, what they want to know in the future. But there's just also this unlock of relationships and context that changes how people feel about the opportunity to learn and the process of learning that seems to drive performance. And so and on top of knowing where you want to go, um, being able to actually make that, especially when it gets challenging journey, um, needs to seem to be uh, unlocking that is, seems to be a part of this equation. Are there things about the design of the future system or the kinds of tools and resources that are available that you think could actually facilitate those kinds of, of really critical relationships or context for people to do work? Uh, well, I, I would say that we understand too that, that that those social relationships and the social context uh, of learning uh, yeah. and the entire context of learning, but in particular the people that, that are you know involved uh, in every learner's journey, uh, whether it's teachers, parents, you know, uh, advisors, counselors, mentors, uh, are critical uh, part of that journey, and we do have to also understand that. But again, I I guess I just keep going back to yes, yes, there is a lot to know and measure about a learner. Uh, and, and if to get the full picture of a learner, yes, you do have to know all of the different um, social contexts in which they function. Uh, because, you know, as we also know that it is, it is more often the case that, than, than not that if they fail to get to their learning goal, it's because, uh, you know, they didn't have the right support. Got it. Um, and, and just so, really yeah. quickly, I, I'm going to, because I'm going to ask you to um, start to take us into the close. Is is there anything about AI and its introduction to this um, body of work that you think has got a real potential for helping us with the unlock? Yeah, we do. You know, we, we use AI as a, a tool in what we build, but it is used as a tool, meaning um, we're not here to try to, uh, to replace teachers with AI. We're here to assist teachers with AI so that teachers have more time to spend with students. Um, they, that, that a lot of the, the work that they have to do, grading papers, even creating you know, assessment items, formative assessment or teaching materials is, is assisted by the AI. Uh, and we think there's tremendous uh, potential for that. Um, and, and when we're talking about measurement, uh, you know, measurement of complex things like social relationships and the path of learning that also involves modeling that we, we can do using AI. So Fantastic. AI is, is a, a useful technology tool that has become, you know, uh, that has made huge advances uh, since I was studying it back in the 80s at MIT. Um, but it is not the focus of our of our effort. It is just a, it. It is a, it is a powerful is tool a, like a lot of other technology tools that we, that we try to use. Fantastic. Um, and that actually creates a, a great bridge because one of the things that we talked a lot about is the importance of, of how we actually know, um, how we know how what students know and are able to do at a given point, how they're feeling effectively, what's going on in the context around them. That requires new systems of measurement um, that we actually haven't had at our disposal in the past. 
Uh, Pam, I know you put a ton of thought into um, what the future of measurement needs to look like in order to take into consideration all of the things that are important to producing great learning experiences and environments. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, um, and how we get to a place where we can actually know whether the context and the other things that influence uh, young people are actually in place? I will do that. Um, I, I love how many times Lukeman used the word journey because the word journey means different places, different times. It's, it's a trajectory over which there is a lot of change. And we know that our measurement systems today don't factor that in. So we're talking about a new frontier of measurement, both what we measure, but also how we measure it. So first principle would be holism. We need multiple measures because as, as all of us have been talking about, we want the fullest possible picture of an individual student. Yes, the academic piece, but all those skills for learning work in life, the, the learning how to learn skills and wellness. But we're also gonna need some different kinds of measures. So second principle, we've talked about it, is the power of context. We don't measure it. We have to measure the fish and the lake, and we have to know what about that lake, what factors in the learning context are actually driving performance, and which ones are actually holding students back. And the third principle is that human growth and performance isn't linear. It's jagged, as Todd Rose describes in his book, End of Average. There are bursts, there are plateaus, and most of the time we don't know enough about why they happen when they happen. So for practitioners and even for students themselves, and Lukeman talked about this, it, they need to know what the drivers of performance are, what the barriers are, but how to adjust and improve in real time. So here's what that would take. So there are ways that all of us are like all of us. We all have brains, hearts, and kidneys. There are ways in which we are different than some others. So for instance, there are different gender groups. But there are also ways that each of us is not like anyone else. And this is the dimension that we do not measure in our learning systems. Can you imagine preparing for a marathon and measuring performance with one or two indicators once a year. Most other systems of measurement today are personalized and they factor in context, like medicine or sports. So you go to the doctor, your blood is drawn, or you get your blood pressure taken, it's yours. It's an individual measure of what's going on in your body. And if you compare that number to a group and the number is off, you will ask the right question. Why is my white count high? And then, Asking that right question will get you to the right answer. Likely an infection, you'll be put on an antibiotic. Your blood work will be taken again and again until it's known that you're cured. We don't do that for learners. And in sports, you always have to consider factors that affect performance, yes. meaning athletes perform differently in different contexts, and they need to know all about context to optimize their performance. They want to know what the conditions will be that will create the greatest chances for success. Fantastic. And we're, we're running into our last couple of minutes here. And Sanjay, I wanted to come to you last because you actually talk about something we haven't talked a lot about today, but the joy and fun that can be created in learning and learning environments. And so can you talk a little bit about how we actually bring that in and what that would look like to design for it? Yeah, you know, I think we take away context to Pam's point we take away agency, we take away curiosity, which is related to context, we take away passion. Um, done right, we re-inject those, and we add coaching, which is really where the teacher comes in. That, coming back to my original comment, is what parents do, right? And I think that, I don't know, but between the, ch if I had a choice of joyless education and joyful education, I think I would pick the latter. And somehow we have picked the former, and I think it's time to change. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank each and all of you for what has been a, like a, a session that has been packed with insight and information that I think actually holds keys to unlocking the future that we all want for our children. Um, I, I'm grateful for this one thing about the new world that we live in is that it's been recorded and so we can watch it over and over and over again. 
Uh, looking forward to connecting with each of you in the near future. And best to everyone in the audience. I hope that you um, are inspired by what you hear today from many of